Okay. Hello and uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining uh, Morningstar Investment Management's uh, quarterly update for the March quarter. It, it was a, a very interesting quarter indeed. I, my name's Matt Waitcher. I'm the Chief Investment Officer for Asia Pacific and we're very lucky today to be joined by Daniel Needham, our uh, President and Global CIO, who many of you know, and he's joining us from Chicago. Uh, so thank you, Daniel, for, for taking the time to, to talk to us all. Matt, happy to be here. Great. So just a couple of housekeeping items to start. Um, firstly, we'll be uh, sending out CPD certificates next week after the Easter break. Uh, I need to just inform you of the disclaimer before we start as well. We, we haven't considered any individual person's uh, objectives, financial situation, or uh, particular needs, and th this presentation will be general in advice, in, in <coughs> general in uh, content. Uh, we'll talk for about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, and then we'll make sure that we answer all of your questions, or as many as we can get through. Uh, and, and you can ask questions through using the Q&A button on your screen there. And finally, before we get into it, uh, a, a uh, recording of this video uh, this webinar will be sent to you uh, tomorrow, along with a summary video and scripted slides that you can uh, use with your clients if, if you so choose to. So just setting the scene a little bit, at the last webinar that I presented at, uh, we were right in the midst of the longest uh, bull market of all time. We, we would certainly had discussion around that. Valuations we felt were very high, uh, especially in uh, US and Australian markets. And uh, so today we thought, given the, the huge change uh, since our last webinar, less than three months ago in markets, uh, we'd get Daniel to give his views on, on uh, generally how we see things, uh, certainly around portfolio performance. We have some interim numbers for, for, for March in already and for the quarter and uh, where we think the opportunities are going forward and how we feel our portfolios will perform. So getting into it, Daniel, to start with, I thought we'd talk about uh, what's knowable. And, and certainly when we look back over the, the last uh, few months, coronavirus, uh, certainly governments shutting down economies, these things uh, I'm pretty sure no one at Morningstar Investment Management even tried to predict or, or, or could have predicted. And certainly very few in, in the market three months ago would have, would have expected governments to be shutting down economies on purpose uh, to protect citizens. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that in the context of our investment process. Sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Matt, and, uh, and welcome to everybody that's joining us. And uh, I'm uh, very happy to be able to provide, uh, provide an update. Um, you know, we talk a lot about this idea of what's knowable and uh, what's important. And so we, we have the slide which shows, you know, things that are, that are important and things that are unimportant. And then there are things that are knowable and things that are unknowable. And, and I think anybody that's heard us talk will, will be very clear about uh, the many important things that uh, people want to know the answer to that we think are just unknowable. And, uh, and I think when we, when we were in town, when I was in town for the, the recent road shows, I think we were pretty clear in saying, look, we, we don't know whether the coronavirus will turn into a global recession or whether there'll be a quick recovery. We, we, and we didn't think anybody else, anybody else knew. And, uh, and I guess as, as it's gone by, we've realized just how little, uh, how little we can predict these short-term events. And so um, what we would say is that, um, you know, whether or not there'll be a deep contraction or a shallow contraction and uh, when the recovery will, will occur, these are important questions. Um, but in our opinion, they're unknowable. And so over the longer term, we think whether companies and the economy will recover and whether more things will be say similar than different with how companies spend money and then how consumers behave. We think that's more knowable. We think that it's more likely over the medium to long term that things will, you know, generally go back to normal. They won't be exactly the same, but but we would be surprised if there wasn't more things that are similar to now, uh, sorry, similar to before the crisis uh, uh, than afterwards. So we think more things will be the same than different. And so what we focus on, what we think is more knowable is uh, a reasonable long-term path of cash flows and discount rates. And we use those to estimate fair value. And we compare what we think an asset's worth relative to the price that it's trading at. And ideally, we like to buy things for less than they're worth. We think this is a more knowable approach to investing, and that's where we spend a lot of our time. 
means we don't have to spend as much time trying to predict what's going to happen in the next 6, 12, 18 months, but we can focus more on the long term. So rather than trying to predict a precise outcome, we think about a range of possible paths that could, could happen for com- the economy and for companies, for cash flows, and then we compare that to what's priced in. And uh, we like to, to apply Keynes, uh, Lord Maynard Keynes's view, it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. And, and that's where we, we focus a lot of our time. So <clears throat> thanks for that. Given, given we felt we were very prepared uh, for a range of outcomes, but certainly uh, uh, some sort of risk event going forward uh, back in, in uh, mid-February, how, how do you think our portfolios have stood up and, and why do you think they've performed the way they have over the last uh, six weeks? Yeah, I mean, I think like all uh, strategies that invest for the long term, we held a decent exposure to equities. And, you know, during the market volatility, equity markets fell heavily. And, uh, and obviously, our portfolio has also experienced what we think of as temporary losses. And so, um, but as many of you know, we held pretty large allocations to cash and high quality fixed income, given our views on the investment environment. Um, obviously, we didn't predict this kind of event happening, but more that we felt that the reward for risk wasn't attractive. And so, it made sense to have, you know, much higher levels of cash than maybe uh, you would normally have. Um, you know, the portfolios generally fell less than uh, similar multi-asset type strategies and certainly a lot less than Australian equities. And so, you know, the, the growth real return fund fell about 7.8% in March. The growth managed account fund fell about 7.8%, as you can see. And a representative index, which is, you know, based off the asset allocation of, of a similar peer group using market indexes, fell about 11.6%. So, you know, we captured about two thirds of the downside, which in our opinion is, is, um, is the kind of outcome we'd expect in this environment. And compared obviously to the uh, S&P ASX 200 was down around 20%. So we've, we obviously protected a lot more on the downside uh, than the equity market. Um, we obviously would have preferred to see portfolios down less, but you know, on the whole, we felt like they performed pretty consistent with um, what we would have expected uh, in this environment. You know, one important sort of point to note is that we've been finding value in more cyclical parts of the stock market, um, obviously based on our long-term valuation-driven approach. And so with the sell-off in stock, some of the parts of the market that we liked, so energy, for example, European financials, they also experienced substantial falls. So, you know, the, the, the parts of the market where we were investing for returns definitely felt the, the, the brunt of the sell-off. But that's why the cash in the portfolios, you know, having that extra cash allows us to take advantage of those and provided an important buffer. So the things that we, you know, we liked uh, that we owned going in, you know, to the sell off in March, we certainly like even more now as um, prices are lower and prospective returns are, are higher. And that's why, you know, holding cash is really such an important part of our strategy. So where do you see the opportunities now? Maybe focus regionally first and then we can talk uh uh, a bit more specifically in sectors uh, as we go from there. Yeah, I mean, I'd say sort of in general, um, you know, markets obviously, equity markets were, were, were the parts of the markets that took the, the biggest brunt of the, the change in environment. And so, you know, we in general, we like equities more, uh, you know, liked them a lot more in March than we did in, in January. Um, and um, But from a regional perspective, as you can see, This shows you the valuation implied returns um, of the major equity regions. And you'll see that generally the order or the rank of the things that we like, um, the higher returns versus the lower returns, that rank was largely in order. And so, uh, you know, UK equities still at the top of the list, effectively Japanese equities still towards the top of the list there. Uh, European equities obviously up there and, you know, US equities towards the bottom of the list. So the actual rank of what we like and what we don't like didn't change that much, um, which, uh, as I said, you know, some of those markets, especially, say, the UK and, and Europe, certainly sold off quite a lot as well. Um, so we're seeing opportunities, obviously, in the, those same parts of the market. US equities, whilst they didn't sell off as much as um, uh, they didn't sell off enough to move them into the more attractive range relative to the other markets. So US stocks didn't really fall that much more than other markets. Um, But within the US stock market, there were sectors and parts of the market that definitely got a lot more attractive. Um, And so this gives you an idea of the global sectors. So you'll see that energy uh, is the the one that moved up the most. That's the light blue line. So that's that's global energy. So that's oil and gas companies. That's uh, oil services businesses. So the businesses that supply uh, 
oil companies to be able to drill and extract oil. Um, it's also the refiners, how you convert, say, oil into, into petroleum products. So they all sold off really heavily, obviously, on the back of the Saudi Russia sort of OPEC plus meltdown combined with you know, what is expected to be pretty substantial contraction in oil demand. Um, and then also financials, you know, they're inevitably viewed as a, as a very cyclical exposure. So when you've got falling interest rates and you've also got uh, falling uh, uh, growth expectations, you also see financials get hit pretty hard. So again, a pretty similar order. We didn't see a huge shift in the rank of the things that we liked versus the things that we didn't like. Um, so generally, you know, the, the things that we liked, we like more now. And the things that we didn't like, we maybe like a little more, more but they're not as attractive. So, um, you know, you'll see us focus in on energy, um, financials, uh, also some of the more cyclical sectors. Uh, so airlines, uh, we're doing work on travel, airlines, things like that. Um, you know, we'll be, we'll be more interested in, in those opportunities. So you spoke about cash. Uh, perhaps you can talk through uh, some of the changes that we've made uh, and how you see those. And, uh, I yeah. Guess. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's always nice to, to come back and talk about, you know, the Australian strategies because, you know, we've been running this approach for, for a decade now and, um, and it's nice to see um, as much as we don't like the environment, obviously because of the, the negative consequences, it's also good to see, you know, the opportunities that we can take advantage of with our approach. And so, you know, we followed, uh, Warren Buffett's advice, you know, we've been able to be greedy when others have been fearful. And this was only possible because we were being fearful when others were greedy over the last, say, five years, um, three to five years, as we've been incrementally building that cash up. So during March, especially, but certainly towards the end of February, you know, we were adding to equities, reducing cash and bonds, especially the sort of the high quality bonds. So um, government bonds where yields have fallen a lot. Um, so equities have generally become more attractive. But as I mentioned before, some sectors and, and individual companies are, are more attractive than others. So we've been targeting those, but we've been adding to Australian equities, especially in more under, underpriced parts of the market. Also adding to international equities uh, and especially obviously to energy stocks. We think the dislocation in the energy market, whilst painful in the short term, really presents unusual value uh, in the long term, given the fact that we think oil prices over time will normalize. There's a lot of economic incentives to cut production. We're seeing you know, conversations between OPEC and the United States that frankly, you just would, you would have stretched your imagination to think that that conversation would even be happening. So, um, so we've been reducing cash and, uh, and, and bonds and, and then moving into, um, into equities. So you can see that in the, in the chart. So this shows you the allocation uh, of the growth real return fund. Uh, so what it looked like in January and then what it looked like at the end of March. And, you know, what you can see is that, you know, equities went from 53.9% to 64.6%. So roughly 54% of the portfolio up to 65%. So we've definitely been, we've definitely been buying. So we've definitely been greedy. Uh, there was a lot of buying uh, into the heavy selling in March. And so we really stopped buying or investing, stopped buying stocks and equities uh, coming around, around about the 23rd of March, when the which in now actually at least is the most recent low, and once markets rallied very heavily from the 24th onwards, we've we've stopped buying and we've just sort of been you know uh, uh, in a in in a holding pattern for want of a better expression. Yeah, still plenty of firepower to go there. Um, in, in That's that right. As well. That's right. Um, so perhaps uh, you can talk through just some of the. This is kind of the vintages that, that we've uh, employed, the vintages approach, and how, how we, you know, some of the positions that we're exiting, they're getting a bit long in the tooth, and, and the new ones coming on board, and how you see those. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the uh, visual of how we think about um, uh, investments that we add to the portfolio. So this is a, you know, this is looking at things at a relatively granular level, but we're not going quite to the individual stock level. Um, so you know, we've been building. So the way to think about it is the, the, the parts of the market on the left, they're the positions that we're establishing. And then as you move through time, we increase the holding position. And these are the, 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 the higher conviction parts of the portfolio. And then as prices rise and as the market starts to maybe reflect uh, the, the fundamental value in prices, we'll start to exit the positions. And so they mature 
and then they're effectively harvested out of the portfolio. So what you can see on the, the far right is we've been reducing our Australian government bonds and developed government bonds as bond yields have really plumbed new lows. Consumer staples, you know, the sectors we liked previously in the US were consumer staples and healthcare, well, they've held up really well. Um, now, the other end of the spectrum, you've got things like energy stocks, US banks, auto manufacturers, airlines, you know, parts of the market that have just really been hit hard. I mean, sub-investment grade debt, we saw, you know, we saw high yield spreads exceed 10%. Um, even REITs, which have generally been viewed as a pretty safe play in a low yield environment because of the debt, especially in that second week of March, uh, we just saw levered businesses get crushed around the world. And so, you know, REITs are back on, you know, are back on the table for us. So, uh, so they're the kind of gives you a sense of how we think about things um, as we, we, we cycle positions through the portfolio. Thanks. And, and given that we're pushing into these sectors, I guess, what should advisors be thinking about uh, future performance for us? And, and importantly, what, what are the messages they should, perhaps should uh, be giving to their clients about how, you know, how, perf how, how, how perf portfolios will uh, perform going forward from this point? Yeah, I mean, I think as you'll see in the allocation section, we've increased the equity exposure. So we've had cash for a long time. And so we've been more on the defensive side. So, you know, when the markets were going down, we captured less of the downside. You know, as we're shifting from cash and, and government bonds into equities, as you'll see, some of the equities we're investing in are relatively cyclical, very, very out of favour parts of the market. We're doing that in a very measured way, but we're adding risk in the portfolio. So, you know, prospectively, you know, we think the, the portfolio is a position to deliver, um, you know, very decent long-term returns. And, and that's increasing, obviously, as we add more uh, as markets um, have fallen. Um, I would say that the way to think about our strategies is that, um, you know, we are value investors. We like to buy things when they're underpriced. We're not, we're not conservative investors that are always going to have tons of cash in our portfolio. And so what that means is that um, as we're entering periods like this, the portfolio is going to hold up better. Um, uh, that means when we hold, you know, much higher cash levels, you'll see our portfolios fall less. The further markets fall, the more likely we are to invest that capital. The more fully invested we're going to be, the more volatile the strategies will be. So, you know, leading up to around the, you know, 23rd of March, we've been adding, you know, a decent slug of equities in the, the growth real return fund. So, you know, should markets fall, we've got a lot more cash to put to work. And so we'll be continuing to take advantage of the opportunities if they, you know, uh, fall heavily from where they are now, we're in a good spot. I think the key thing for advisors um, to think about is that our portfolios are going to behave, um, let's say they'll be a bit more volatile, it'll be a bumpier ride going forward. And we think that's fine because we've now got assets in the portfolio that we bought at very attractive prices. Um, now we're not fully invested, we haven't gone all in, but we've certainly put a decent amount of capital to work, but we're ready you know, to take advantage of even more attractive prices. And so I would say the strategies have shifted from capital, a very strong focus on capital preservation to one of return generation. You can't do both, you have to choose. And we think that, that the opportunities that are present or were present in March certainly presented us with some really attractive uh, buying opportunities. Um, now, this is an uncertain environment. We don't know what's going to happen. Markets could certainly fall much further from here and we could see new lows made. The bottom line is nobody knows that um, no one can predict that. So we, we need to be ready to buy. And so, you know, to quote Warren Buffett, um, you know, it's not that we like pessimism. It's that we like the share prices uh, that pessimism brings. And, uh, and so we think as the pessimism rises and, and is potentially more reflected in prices, then we will we'll be a lot more aggressive and, and put more capital to work. Great, thanks. Um, any final points before we move into the question, the question and answers uh, around you know, advisors that are thinking of moving their clients into these portfolios from this point in time? Uh, anything to add there or? or? Um, I mean, I would just say that understand our investment philosophy and, um, and make sure that it's right for your clients. Um, you know, I would say if you thought of us as a very defensive uh, uh, shop before this, um, I would say make sure you understand that we're, we're repositioning the portfolios. We're a value investor. We're valuation-driven investors. We're not, we're not um, defensive investors. We're risk-averse. That means we like to be compensated for the risks that we take. But, um, but just it's important that people understand our investment approach. We, we at times will look very different. And in this environment, that means as more people get bearish and more people get concerned about owning stocks and you know, think that the only thing to do is to be in cash, well, we'll be doing the opposite. 
And that's important that, that clients understand that. Great, thanks. Well, we're getting a few questions flow through, so Great. let me uh, pose them to you. Uh, some of them quite specific, so I'll start, start with this one. In terms of interest rates, how low do you, or how do you think they'll, they're gonna play out in Australia? And uh, mm. what would negative rates look like for the economy here in Australia? Any views on that? Yeah, I mean, I've, we obviously, we don't know um, whether, whether they will. I would say it seems unlikely based off the uh, comments the RBA has made, also the comments that the Federal Reserve has made, and also the com comments that the Bank of England have made. I'd say the Bank of International S Settlements has done um, a number of uh, research pieces on the impact of uh, negative interest rates on the banking sector, and it doesn't look good. And so I would say that um, central bankers are probably more concerned about the impact of negative rates than, than they've ever been. So even though the economic conditions have deteriorated a lot, um, I think the uh, likelihood that central bankers move to negative rates is probably lower than what it was when Germany and, and um, Japan implemented negative rates. Um, what, what I think does matter is that central banks like what Japan is doing, which is targeting interest rates of what the Australian government has announced they're going to do at the five year, I think the five year, three year um, uh, point um, is effectively showing that for monetary sovereigns like Australia, the central bank can set government interest rates at any level they want and they can stand ready to buy or issue securities to get the yield level they want. And so um, I think that the central banks and the government are in control of interest rates in certainly government instruments. And so, you know, I would not be surprised to see interest rates kept low for a very long period of time in Australia, given the fact that there's going to be a lot of debt and fiscal spending. Great. And then, and then I guess the implications of that uh, for the Aussie dollar, there's a question around, around that. Yeah, that's a complicated question. Um, because what matters for the Australian dollar is obviously what other currents, what other governments right. do as well. And so, um, you know, the US dollar really rallied pretty heavily uh, as it was kind of, you know, it's the reserve currency. And there's a lot of borrowing that happens in the US dollar, in US dollars. And so as people delever in a, in a period of crisis, they effectively sell foreign currency and they buy US dollars. And so we saw a huge rally in the US dollar this year. Um, but the US government is effectively taking some very aggressive fiscal and monetary policy steps. They're also opening up swap lines to the different central banks around the world so the RBA can get access to dollars. And so actually there's been a significant change in dollar funding around the world. So you've got to take into consideration the relative policy settings. Um, the Australian economy arguably needs a weaker exchange rate uh, uh, to, um, to stimulate uh, external demand. So, um, you know, I would say... For an economy like Australia, there's going to be a number of pressures that we'll be facing. Um, but a lot of developed economies are, are going to be probably doing similar things. So it won't be as that targeting interest rates, um, keeping rates very low, maybe won't be as negative as it would be in an environment where others weren't doing it. Um, you know, we're valuation driven. So we'll look at the what we think is a fair value for the currency and then help that sort of inform us. And, and we're probably saying the Aussie dollar is probably a little cheap at the moment. Matt, that's right, based off yes, our valuation. That's right. yeah. Yeah. Uh, so on balance, you know, we're probably a little more bullish on the Australian dollar, but uh, in the short term, uh, you know, we could see huge volatility. Next question. Uh, when you think we start to see the second wave of this correction, uh, recessionary, condi <clears throat> recessionary conditions fully impact the real economy and, and business performance, do you think that'll be the driver? I don't know. Um, I mean, I, look, I think there's a wide range of outcomes here. This is a fascinating question because I would say the consensus right now across most uh, money managers and people that, you know, are, are, are relatively close to financial markets is they're waiting for the other shoe to drop. They're waiting for, uh, you know, equity markets to sort of, you know, this is kind of, it's been called a sucker's rally or a bear market rally, and, which is not uncommon in, uh, in recessionary environments. But, you know, have we made the lows? Or will we make new lows? I don't know. I mean, I think if you have a positive scenario where the, the um, people press pause and and um, and governments are able to get companies through and keep people's incomes relatively stocked up, and you don't see large numbers of business failures, and so effectively, you know, you, the governments are able to get people to the other side, and then things pick up quickly. You know, markets tend to look forward. They tend to they tend to look through the economic cycle. So there's a there's a sort of a 
uh, a rule of thumb where people say markets look six to nine months ahead of the of the economy. Now, that if that's the case, then we may well have seen lows. But uh, but if this is a longer drawn out um, economic environment, we may see further lows. We we don't know. Um, uh, we're ba based off valuations. We think it makes sense to be more invested today than we were in January, but things aren't cheap enough for us to be all in. And so, um, and, and that's what's really driving it. And if things, if things rally up from here and, and it's a recovery, we'll feel good that we put capital to work, but we, uh, if they fall further and make new lows, well, we're in a good spot to buy more. Great. That's a good lead into the, the next question. Uh, I note that although we've increased our exposure to growth assets, it's, it's been uh, funded from defensive, uh, slightly more so than cash. Can you talk through why defensive and not just cash? Um, well, effectively, um, within defensive, we've got a lot of different investments in there. And so we have government bonds, government bond exposure in there. And so um, if you think about what's happened, we've seen, um, cash rates come down, but we've also seen bond yields fall heavily. And so, you know, the defensive portfolio is where a lot of our duration sits in the multi-asset portfolio in the, the growth real return. So, so we've reduced cash, but we probably like, we like cash more than we like, you know, long-term government bonds. So, so we, that, that's been a better funding source for us because we, you know, we, we, we're concerned about, Interest rates being very low. I mean, look, governments can keep rates low for a very long period of time. The US government capped interest rates for nearly two decades after World War II when they had run up huge deficits. And so, um, but, but there is a risk of inflation and, and, uh, and a risk of sharply rising interest rates. Um, and so therefore, you know, funding from bonds made, made more sense. Do you have anything to add on that, Matt? No, I, th I think that just when we were looking at the reward for risk there, you know, uh, certainly, you for a real return portfolio that, that uh, bonds still look very expensive, even in the current environment uh, and, and, you know, keeping our powder dry in cash uh, seem to be uh, a better risk reward opportunity as well. Yeah. And, and the cash can be used to buy high yield bonds and, right. um, you know, emerging market debt that, that may get more heavily sold off. Um, and so having that cash could, could mean that we can take more risk on, on the fixed income side as well. That's right. Uh, next question, advisors, uh, are advisors worried about selling down other portfolios and moving during these times? We may not be able to answer that specifically, but uh, uh, I think... Yeah, I mean, I think in environments like this, um, there can be concerns about doing anything because it's just such a terrifying environment to be doing to do anything you know there's so much uncertainty there's so much volatility um if i move what if the markets rally you know if i if i stay what if that falls more than other strategies i think it's just a very uncertain and tough time and so um and often advisors have got as everybody on the line will know you know you get a lot of questions from clients and you've got a lot of things to do um, so so that can be a concern i think from a tax perspective uh if you've built up um uh, you know, over time, you know, there, there's maybe unrealized um, gains on some taxable assets. Uh, you know, this can be a, a time where you can move portfolios because markets are down a lot. So therefore the tax consequences can be a lot more, uh, can be a lot less than they were, say, when markets were 25% higher than where they are now. So that can be, that can be a, that can be something that can make it easier to move in these environments. Hmm. We've got a uh, specific question about airlines here. Well, Warren Buffett typically hates airlines because the potential for any number of events to affect their value, uh, because of any number of events that could affect their value. But we're looking to invest. Why is that? Um, well, I think there's a few things. The airline industry, uh, especially US airlines, um, effectively went through a consolidation. So they've had a terrible track record and, you know, um, you know, they've had bankruptcies and, um, you know, crazy competition and huge, you know, huge uh, expansion of, um, of seat miles. But, you know, certainly in the last decade, there's the industry has been a lot more rational. There's been a consolidation. Um, the, the airlines, the main, the major carriers effectively have their own hubs and generally they've just behaved in a lot more sensible rational way uh, 
in how they're competing with each other, how they're managing their seat miles, how they're pricing their seats. Um, and so it's just been a much better um, industry. Profitability has been much higher. Uh, they've moved up to a, a higher level of profitability. Generally, the debt's been more manageable, so they have been more sensible with their leverage, although leverage is certainly potentially going to go up if uh, some of the uh, loans are from the US government are there. Um, and they've got credit card businesses, which are very lucrative for them, very capital light businesses. And then they've got their rewards businesses, which again, so when you add a, an industry that's behaving more rationally, that's generating more profitability, uh, it's got less leverage. And then you add those other very valuable assets like credit cards and, and seat miles, you actually get a very different dynamic. And so uh, even going into the crisis, the airlines actually looked okay. I mean, obviously this is a, an event that hit them ground zero uh, and was, you know, largely unforecastable. But even then, you know, the prices have fallen so much that, um, uh, that, that they, you know, on valuation alone, they look attractive. They're definitely riskier. There's no doubt about it. They're cyclical, they're capital intensive. They've got some leverage. They're exposed, you know, directly to uh, uh, um, so the, the restrictions because of, the, because of COVID-19. But you've got to balance that re relative to price and, and you can be diversified uh, and you can take a long-term view. And, um, and so, again, I think, you know, in hindsight, you know, you, um, you would have rather owned them now than in uh, December. And, and we've obviously been building our position in February, I think, was that? Uh, um, early, March, uh, March, early March. Early March. Yeah. So, so towards the end of February, you know, they became m much more attractive. And then in, in March, they started to fall heavily. So, um, and so look, there's no doubt they're risky, but, uh, and again, you don't want to bet the farm on anything, you know, any one industry. So we'll be very sensible in how we, uh, we, we, we manage the exposure. At this stage, it's a very small exposure, less than a percent. Yeah, but you know, Southwest, you know, Delta. I mean, um, uh, American United Airlines. They, these are these are these are good businesses. Yeah, agree. So uh, the next question is: it's kind of related. In fact, uh, can you comment on world governments and their potential intervention in propping up companies or sectors, i.e., bailouts, and whether these present risks or opportunities? Um, so I think the, um, whether they're bailouts is a separate question. I think, um, there, I think for some industries that have been directly affected by government, uh, implemented restrictions like airlines, um, like, uh, hotels, like restaurants, um, you know, these are, these, these have been shut down effectively by government. And so these are rescue packages rather than bailouts. Um, there's a lot of discussion around buybacks and dividends. And, you know, look, there's an argument to be made that they should have had better cash buffers. You know, even, even very strong cash buffers are going to struggle to offset the contraction in revenue that these businesses are going to, to, to experience in the second quarter. Um, the, I think we operate, we operate in a system where, um, you know, the... The global economy is very interconnected. It's very complex. It's a, it's a leveraged financial system that we have. And you can't really shut it down. Um, I mean, that's, it's a bit like a nuclear reactor. <laughs> you know, the old nuclear reactors, uh, effectively, when you, got, when you try to shut them down, you risk a meltdown. And I think that's what we have. We have a lot of uh, assets. We have incomes that are variable that are tied to, to real, real economies, the real, real economic output. And we have nominal debts that are fixed. And so it means the system can be open to debt deflation. And so um, you need a big government and you need a big bank. You, you know, the government needs to be the employer and spender of last resort. And the central banks need to be the lender and financial asset purchaser of last resort. That's what came out of the, uh, after the Great Depression. That's what, you know, FDR implemented in the, the United States and it became much broader around the world. I think that system has been put in place for a reason. So in extreme events like this, Governments need to step in because they're the only actor, economic actor. Now, whether or not that is an equitable approach based off who gets the gains and who wears the losses is a political question that I think is going to become more and more relevant around the world. As, a, as an investor and a long-term investor, I think you, you should be factoring in some of these things uh, when you're looking at the, the, the range of outcomes, both from a positive but also from a negative perspective. I think there's questions of inflation, which I can address if, if that's another question that comes up. Yeah, the, the, there is actually a question on inflation. Uh, is the economy moving into a 
state of deflation or inflation more likely? There you go. Uh, so I think in the short term, if you were kind of, you know, you have deflation and inflation, uh, you know, I would say the dial at the moment is firmly, the, is, is firmly pushing towards deflation. I think the massive contraction in income around the world is, is very deflationary. Um, I think that, that um, the risk, you know, the risk of things, you know, you get a self-reinforcing cycle. So you see rising um, uh, business failures, bankruptcies, uh, you know, loan defaults, uh, you know, entrenched unemployment. That's the risk in this system is you get a debt deflation. Um, and I think governments and central banks are aware of that. And that's why you're seeing such extremely large fiscal and monetary responses, because that is something that you want to avoid. So in the short term, it seems like deflation is arguably the, the bigger risk. In the medium to long term, you know, assuming that you, uh, governments are effective, uh, which we think they will be, we think in the medium to long term, companies and economies will recover and more things will be, be similar than different. Um, you know, the question is, will the uh, aggregate demand that's you know, sort of supported by governments, increase government spending, will that be inflationary? And I think the question is, does that create excess demand relative to supply? And, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's, you know, the, there's the monetarist view around, you know, Friedman saying that every inflation is, is, is always a monetary phenomenon, which I would argue that, you know, the last 30 years has effectively debunked that. And so, um, you know, what, what drives inflation appears to be excess demand relative to supply, whether it's the government spending or whether it's a private sector spending, whether it's financed by a bank balance sheet or a central bank balance sheet, it causes the same effect. There's a limited number of real resources available in the economy. And the more demand there is for those resources, the higher the price for those resources will be. And so I think if the government is competing with the private sector for resources, then we'll see inflation. Um, there may be bottlenecks or there may be situations where certain companies are effectively in a very strong competitive position and so they've got pricing power. That means that you could see more of an inflationary bias in the system. I think if governments are stimulating demand, they all, they'll also need to be very aware of the impact of inflation, which they have the tools to deal with it, with monetary and fiscal policy. Um, I mean, this is how the world used to be managed before the movement away from um, uh, fiscal policy. Great. We've got a couple of questions that are similar here that, that I'll uh, summarise. Effectively, they're saying the questions are around, we still have 19% cash. Uh, what would it take to be all in? And uh, are the markets currently the investment market's not showing great opportunities to invest that cash. Um, well, I think the strategy itself is designed to, to, to manage to a certain level of downside risk. And so, um, you know, we would need to see, you know, substantially lower um, prices to be sort of fully invested. And, uh, uh, but, but, you know, if we saw prices down 10, 20, 30% you know, from here, ideally 30%, we'd be, we'd be putting a lot of that cash to work. Um, what the, what's the minimum level we'd have? I mean, probably going to see, you know, five to 10% would probably be that level. Um, and it would also depend on the attractiveness of the fixed income market. So if we saw, you know, corporate uh, sub-investment grade debt, emerging market debt spreads really wide, you know, we may even reduce cash further uh, below that level. Um, it's going to be opportunity dependent, obviously, um, and, uh, but, you know, look, I, if the consensus is right that the, the shoe, there's, an, the, the, there's another shoe to drop, then you'll, you'll see us put a lot more of that cash to work. Great. But yeah, I'd 100% agree with that. I think you're also what we're buying cyclically, uh, those cyclical assets, even though they've been beaten up a lot, we need to really manage that downside risk in the portfolio as well. Um, we have one uh, other question, similar, uh, vein, but specific to the US, the US market seems overly op optimistic on the ability for, for it to come out the other side of this crisis, particularly given what appears to be an absence of national strategy. What are your thoughts? Um, I mean, there's optimism. There's, it, yeah, I think you have to disentangle things and sort of say, well, what's, what are the, what's in the market price? Like, um, I think if you look at the S&P 500 and you look at how far it's down and you know, things have not fallen that far. If you look at where the price is now to where the all time high is. Um, uh, but if you look at the, 
the economic potential economic downside, which looks pretty substantial. I mean, we're talking about arguably one of the largest contractions, quarterly contractions in GDP that we'll ever see uh, are hitting um, hitting the US in the second quarter, potentially worse than you know periods in the Great Depression. So uh, it's going to be pretty substantial. Um, I don't think. I think if you talk to people about the health situation, if you talk to people about the economic situation here, if you talk to people about potential changes in people's behaviour, I would say generally people are more on the pessimistic side. Um, uh, you know, I think there's lots of concerns about how long the virus is going to continue, whether you know whether the, the curve is going to be flattened, whether New York is a precursor for you know Chicago and other cities. I'm in Chicago. Um, I would say there's a fair amount of pessimism out there from a sort of, a, let's call it a fundamental, you know, the health, economic and company fundamentals. Market prices, on the other hand, are not demonstrating that same level of pessimism. And so, um, I mean, I think the United States is gonna make it out, out, out on the other side. I, I, you know, I think the, um, the, the policy responses, while say, yeah, they're un they seem uncoordinated. The United States is the United States of America. It's, it's made up of states. That's how it was designed. The difference between federal responsibility and state responsibility is enshrined in the constitution. There are some things that the federal government's not responsible for, and there are some things that state governments are responsible for. And so the, generally the federal government is reluctant to make national federal decisions on things. That's why you have things like FEMA, which are designed for emergencies. It's actually, it's very uh, inconsistent with sort of the history of the United States for it to be a sort of a federal top down and so it's, it's designed to be a state by state proposition. And that's what you're seeing. Governors have actually stepped in and implemented a lot of the shutdowns that you've seen. And they've made the decisions based off what they think are appropriate for their states. For somebody like if you're from Australia, you know, there's a lot more things that happen at the federal level in Australia than happen in the United States. At least that's my opinion. Um, and so I think, um, I think what you're seeing is something that's sort of more built into the U S structure, which has actually made it a, a resilient system for, over two centuries, um, and uh, but you're going to get these periods where, you know, there's division between parties and there's divisions between what people think is the right thing to do. Um, so we've got two minutes left, and and I've got a, a question here that you could probably answer over two hours, Daniel. Um, so <laughs> we'll need the short answer. Uh, the comments about resource constraints contributing to inflation appear to be in line with modern monetary theory. Can you see M MMT becoming mainstream? And what's the pathway out of the monumental US government debt? <laughs> well, so I think the way I would describe modern monetary theory is it's, it's, it's not a policy prescription. It's not a, um, it's not a recommendation on what governments should do. It's not a value-based assessment of what is good or bad. It's a description of how the modern system works following movement off the gold standard and the, you know effectively the cancelling of Brenton Woods in the 70s it's I think it's an it's a description of how the system works um, and so I wouldn't say my description is necessarily modern monetary theory description I would say it's consistent uh, with their description because I think their description is an accurate uh, reflection of how the system works um, uh, now there are like all it's, I think it's, it's neither good nor bad. It's just how the system is. And I think governments have a much greater ability to spend in their own currency. Not every government can do it. Europe, you know, Spain can't do it. Italy can't do it. Even Germany can't do it. Um, and Hong Kong can't do it because they're tied to the US dollar. So it's a unique situation that happens when you're monetary sovereign. Effectively, people have known about it since the 70s when they broke away from the Bretton Woods system. Um, so I think government debt is um, if you're a monetary sovereign and you're borrowing in your own money, in your own currency, I think Japan has shown that you can accumulate huge amounts of debt without inflation. Um, and, uh, and, and I think we'll potentially see that in the United States. But, um, you know, I, I think Japan faced a very unique situation, which is different to, I think, what the United States faces. So I'm not suggesting that you get the same outcome in Japan or the same level of debt to GDP. But, but I just don't think those debt dynamics are quite as important as they're made out to be for countries that are monetary sovereigns that can borrow, can print their own money effectively. Um, and they can effectively, they can monetize government spending. Um, and what matters from an inflationary perspective is does that government spending, does that create aggregate demand that exceeds aggregate supply? That's the question. And I think that's what governments are gonna be grappling with as they potentially use more and more fiscal policy. Great. Uh, we've got 
I think we're running on time, uh, just over time, but we've got one, one more question around views on gold and uh, inf listed infrastructure. Um, so I, I think from a, we, we value, uh, we have a, we invest in listed infrastructure and we value in listed infrastructure and, and, and generally it was doing quite well. Uh, it had been, become very popular, uh, was arguably overpriced. Um, Certainly got hit pretty hard with the, uh, as similar to REITs when people were concerned about debt, when it went from being sort of more of a, you know, consumer discretionary, you know, travel related sort of sell off to anything that has leverage might not survive. Listed infrastructure and, and REITs also were hit very hard during that, that period in March. And so, um, uh, you know, REIT infrastructure and REITs look more attractive now given that, but on balance, you know, we think there's much more attractive parts of the market than the sort of listed infrastructure right now. Anything to add on that, Matt? No, I think that's right. We, you know, I think we, we would even see REITs, especially in Australia, as, as being a better opportunity than listed infrastructure at this point in time. But, but we're not diving back into either of those at, at the moment. And then gold, you know, look, we don't, gold is, uh, we can't value it. It doesn't pay a cash flow. The question is, you know, does it have properties that can, that can improve portfolios in either an extreme deflationary scenario and extreme inflationary scenario. You know, I think the press is still out on that. Um, fundamentally, we struggle with how you value it. Um, you know, cash gives you no return. Gold gives you no return. Uh, in real terms, you could make the case that gold is, um, is more stable uh, in how it behaves with inflation, but, but it's, it's a very complex question, which we don't know the answer to. And so therefore uh, we don't own it. Agreed. So that, well, that brings us to the end of the uh, the webinar. Uh, I can see from the participants that uh, many people have stayed on for the entire time. So thank you very much to everyone that has that that uh, seen out the webinar. And just a reminder before we head off, uh, we'll send out the CPD certificates uh, next week, just after the Easter break. And uh, thank you, Daniel, for, for staying up late in Chicago and, and talking <laughs> to us today. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. And thanks to everybody for dialing in. Really appreciate it. And I hope everybody stays safe and uh, look forward to touching base when I'm next back in Australia. Great. Thanks a lot.